And here comes conductor Jane Glover to conduct the BBC Concert Orchestra and the BBC Singers in Gilbert and Sullivan's great Savoy opera, The Yeoman of the Guard.
out she sits and sighs, she wanders to and fro. Unbidden teardrops fill her eyes, and to all questions she replies with a sad hey-ho. Tis but a little word, hey-ho, so soft is scarcely heard, hey-ho. An idle breath, yet life and death may hang upon a meeting An idle breath, yet life and death may hang upon a maid's When maiden love she mopes apart as owl mopes on a tree. Although she keenly feels the smart, she cannot tell what ails her heart with its sad army. Tis but a foolish sigh, army, born but to droop and die. Mistress Merrill? Uh, oh, it's you, is it? You may go away if you like, because I don't want you, you know. Haven't you anything to say to me? Oh, yes. Are the birds all caged? The wild beasts all littered down? All the locks, chains, bars and bolts in good order? Is the little ease sufficiently uncomfortable? The racks, pincers, and thumbscrews all ready for work. Ooh, you brute. These allusions to my professional duties are in doubtful taste. I didn't become a head jailer because I like head jailing. I didn't become an assistant tormentor because I like assistant tormenting. We can't all be sorcerers, you know. Ha, you brought that on yourself. Colonel Fairfax is not a sorcerer. He's a man of science and an alchemist. Well, whatever he is, he won't be one long. He's to be beheaded today for dealings with the devil. His master nearly had him last night when the fire broke out in the Beecham Tower. Oh, how I wish he had escaped in the confusion. But take care. There's still time for a reply to his petition for mercy. I'm content to chance that. This evening at half past seven. Ha! You're a cruel monster to speak so unfeelingly of the death of a young and handsome soldier. Young and handsome? How do you know he's young and handsome? Because I've seen him every day these weeks past, taking his exercise on the Beecham Tower. Curse him! There! I believe you're jealous of him now. Jealous of a man I've never even spoken to. Jealous of a poor soul who's to die in an hour. I am. I'm jealous of everybody and everything. I'm jealous of the very words I speak to you, for they reach your ears, and I mustn't go near them. How unjust you are. Jealous of the words you speak to me. 
You know as well as I do, I don't even like them. You used to like them? I used to pretend to like them. It was mere politeness to comparative strangers. I don't believe you know what jealousy is. I don't believe you know how it eats into a man's heart and disorders his digestion and turns his interior into boiling lead. You are a heartless jade to trifle with the delicate organisation of the human interior. <laughs> to you. Good day, Dame Carruthers. Busy today? Uh, busy, I. The fire in the Beecham last night has given me work enough. A dozen poor prisoners. Richard Colfax, Sir Martin Byfleet, Colonel Fairfax, Warren the preacher poet, and half a score others, all packed into one small cell not six feet square. Poor Colonel Fairfax, who's to die today, is to be removed to number 14 in the cold harbour, that he may have his last hour alone with his confessor. And I've to see to that. Poor gentleman. He'll die bravely. I fought under him two years since, and he valued his life as it were a feather. 
He's the bravest, the handsomest, and the best young gentleman in England. He twice saved my father's life. And it's a cruel thing, a wicked thing, and a barbarous thing that so gallant a hero should lose his head. For it's the handsomest head in England. <laughs> For dealings with the devil. Aye, if all were beheaded who dealt with him, there'd be busy doings on Tower Green. <laughs> You know very well that Colonel Fairfax is a student of alchemy, nothing more and nothing less. But this wicked tower, like a cruel giant in a fairy tale, must be fed with blood. And that blood must be the bravest and the best, or it's not good enough for the old blunderdor. Oh, silence, you silly girl. You know not what you say. I was born in the old keep. And I've grown grey in it. And please God, I shall die and be buried in it. And there's not a stone in its walls that is not as dear to me as my own right hand. A gallant Norman foes made a merry land their own, and the Saxon from the conqueror was flying. At his bidding it arose in its van of plea of stone, a sentinel unleaving and undying. Insensible, I trow, as a sentinel should be, though a queen to save her head should come a suing. There's a legend on its brow that is eloquent to me, and it tells of beauty done and duty do. I 
No, my lass, but there is one hope yet. Thy brother Leonard, who was a reward in saving his standard and cutting his way through 50 foes who would have hanged him, has been appointed a yeoman of the guard, will arrive this morning. And as he comes straight from Windsor, where the court is, it may be, it may be that he will bring the expected reprieve with him. Oh, that he may. Amen to that, for the colonel twice saved my life, and I'd give the rest of my life to save his. And wilt thou not be glad to welcome thy brave brother with the fame of whose exploits all England is a ringing? Aye, truly, if he brings the reprieve. And not otherwise. Well, he's a brave fellow indeed, and I like brave men. <laughs> all brave men? Most of them, I verily believe. But I hope Leonard will not be too strict with me. They say he is a very dragoon of virtue and circumspection. Now, my dear old father is kindness itself, and And he... leaves thee pretty well to thine own ways, eh? Well, I've no fears for thee. Thou hast a feather brain, but thou art a good lass. Yes, that's all very well. But if Leonard is going to tell me that I may not do this and I may not do that, and I must not talk to this one or walk with that one, but go through the world with my lips pursed up and my eyes cast down like a poor nun who has renounced mankind, why? As I have not renounced mankind and don't mean to renounce mankind, I won't have it. There. Nay, he'll not check thee more than he's good for thee, Phoebe. He's a brave fellow and bravest among brave fellows. And yet, it seems but yesterday that he robbed the lieutenant's orchard. Father! Leonard, my brave boy, I'm right glad to see thee. <laughs> and so is Phoebe. I... Hast thou brought Colonel Fairfax reprieve? Uh, nay, I have here a dispatch for the lieutenant, but no reprieve for the colonel. Poor gentleman. I, Poor gentleman. I would I had brought better news. I'd give my right hand, nay, my body, my life to save his. Dost thou speak in earnest, my lad? Aye, father, I'm no braggart. Did he not save thy life, and am I not his foster brother? Then hearken to me, thou hast come to join the yeoman of the guard. Well? None has seen thee but ourselves. And a sentry who took but scant notice of me. Now to prove thy words, give me the dispatch and get thee hence at once. Here is money and I'll send thee more. Lie hidden for a space and let no one know. I'll convey a suit of yeoman's uniform to the colonel's cell. He shall shave off his beard so that none shall know him. And I'll own him as my son, the brave Leonard Merrill, who saved his flag and fought his way through 50 foes who thirsted for his life. He will be welcomed here without question by my brother yeoman. I'll warrant that. Now, how to get access to the colonel's cell? The key is with thy sour-faced admirer, Wilfred Shadbolt. I think... I say I think... I can get anything I want from Wilfred. I think, mind, I say, I think, you may leave that to me. Then get thee hence at once, lad, and bless thee for this sacrifice. And take my blessings too, dear, dear Leonard. <laughs> and thine, eh? Thy love is newborn. Wrap it up carefully, lest it take cold and die. <laughs> <laughs> As I waver to and fro, dark danger hangs upon the deed. Dark danger hangs upon the deed. The scheme is rash and well may fail, but ours are not the hearts that quail, the hands that shrink, 
Nelas beer. Nelas beer, good cheer, we may save him yet. Oh, see, father, they bring the poor gentleman from the beach. And, oh, father, his hour is not yet come. No, no, they lead him to the cold harbor tower to await his end in solitude. Oh. But softly the lieutenant approaches, he should not see thee weep. Halt! Colonel Fairfax, my old friend, we meet but sadly. Sir, I greet you with all goodwill, and I thank you for the zealous care with which you have guarded me from the pestilent dangers which threaten human life outside. In this happy little community, death, when he comes, doth so in punctual and businesslike fashion, and like a courtly gentleman, giveth due notice of his advent so that one may not be taken unawares. Sir. You bear this bravely, as a brave man should. Why, sir, tis no light boon to die swiftly and surely, at a given hour and in a given fashion. Truth to tell, I would gladly have my life. But if that may not be, I have the next best thing to it, which is death. <laughs> Believe me, sir, my lot is not so much amiss. <laughs> My poor lass. Nay, pretty one, why weepest thou? Come, be comforted. Such a life as mine is not worth weeping for. Sergeant Merrill, is it not? May I greet my old friend? Why, man, what's all this? Thou and I have faced the grim old king a dozen times, and never has his majesty come to me in such goodly fashion. Keep a stout heart, good fellow. We are soldiers, and we know how to die, thou and I. Truth to tell, it better to die than to live, for in sooth I have tried both. <laughs> Is life a boon? If so, it must befall. That death, whenever he call, must fall too soon. Though for score years he give, yet one would pray to live another moon. What kind of plaint have I, who perish in July, who perish in July? 
I might have had to die to chance in June. I might have had to die to chance in June. Is a life a pawn? Then I count it not a whit. Nay, count it not a whit. The man is well done with it. Soon as he's born, he should the means essay to put the plague away. And I war worn, poor captured fugitive, my life most gladly. I might have had to live another morn. I might have had to live, to live another morn. And now, Sir Richard, I have a boon to beg. I am in this strait for no better reason than because my kinsman, Sir Clarence Poltwistle, one of the secretaries of state, has charged me with sorcery in order that he may succeed to my estate, which devolves to him, provided I die unmarried. As thou wilt most surely do. Nay, as I wilt most surely not do, by your worship's grace. I have a mind to thwart this good cousin of mine. How? By marrying forthwith, to be sure. But heaven no mercy. Whom wouldst thou marry? Nay, I am indifferent on that score. Coming death hath made of me a true and chivalrous knight who holds all womankind in such esteem that the oldest and the meanest and the least favoured of them is good enough for him. So, my good lieutenant, if thou wouldst serve a poor soldier with but an hour to live, find me the first that comes. My confessor shall marry us, and her thou shall be my dishonoured name and a hundred crowns to boot. No such poor thou for an hour of matrimony. Uh, a strange request. I doubt I would be warranted in granting it. There never was a marriage fought with so little of evil to the contracting parties. In an hour, she'll be a widow, and I, a bachelor again, for aught I know. <laughs> well, I, I will see what can be done, for I hold thy kinsman in abhorrence for the scurvy trick he hath played thee. A thousand thanks, good sir. We meet again on this spot in an hour or so. I shall be a bridegroom then, and your worship will wish me joy. Until then, farewell. I'm ready, good fellows. He is a brave fellow, and it is a pity he should die. Now, how to find him a bride at such short notice? <laughs> well, the task should be easy. Sonnet, rondelet, ballad, what you will. Oh, we can dance you, saraban, gondolet, carol, hippanel, or oh, jumping joan. Let us give them the singing farce of the merry man and his maid. Therein is song and dance too. I have a 
song to sing, oh. Sing me your song, oh. It is sung to the moon by a lovelorn loon who fled from the mocking throng. Oh, it's a song of a merry man moping mum whose soul was sad and whose glance was glum, who sipped no sup and who craved no crumb as he sighed for the love of a lady. Haiti, Haiti, misery me, lack a deity. He sipped no sup and he craved no crumb as he sighed for the love of a lady. I have a song to sing, oh. What is your song, oh? It is sung with the ring of the songs they had sang that love with the love life long. Oh, it's a song of a merry maid, peely proud, who loved a lord and who laughed aloud at the moan of the merry man moping mum, whose soul was sad and whose glance was glum, who sipped no sup and who craved no crumb as he sighed for the love of a lady. Hey, hey, misery me, lack a lady, he sipped no sup and he craved no crumb as he sighed for the love of a lady. I have a song to sing, oh. Sing me your song, oh. It is sung to the knell of a churchyard bell and a doleful dirge ding dong. Oh, it's a song of a popinjay bravely born who turned up his noble nose with scorn at the humble merry maid, peely proud, who loved the Lord and who laughed aloud at the moan of the merry man moping mum, whose soul was sad and whose glance was glum, who sipped no sup and who craved no crumb as he sighed for the love of a lady. Lady, lady. Misery me, lack a deity. He sipped no sup and he craved no crumb as he sighed for the love of a lady. I have a song to sing, oh. Sing me your song, oh. It is sung with a sigh and a tear in the eye, for it tells of a right and a wrong. Oh, it's a song of a merry maid once so gay, who turned on a heel and tripped away from the peacock puppy jay bravely born, who turned up his noble nose in scorn at the humble heart that he did not prize. So she begged on her knees with downcast eyes for the love of a merry man moping mum, whose soul was sad and whose glance was glum, who sipped no sup and who craved no crumb as he sighed for the love of a lady. Lady, lady, misery me, lack a deity, his pains were all and he sighed no more, for he lived in the love of a lady. Lady, lady, misery me, lack a deity, his pains were all and he sighed no more, for he lived in the love of a lady. That pretty maid. Aye. Yes, beware! I am armed. Back, sir, is back. This is going too far. <gasps> Thou dost not see the humour of it, eh? Yet there is humour in all things, even in this. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? Hava! Sir, we sang to these folk, and they would have repaid us with gross courtesy. But for your honour's coming. No way with ye! Clear the rabble! <laughs> 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 And now, my girl, who are you and what do you here? Uh, may it please you, sir, we are two strolling players, Jack Point and I, Elsie Maynard, at your worship's service. We go from fair to fair, singing and dancing and playing brief interludes, and so we make a poor living. You two, eh? Are ye man and wife? No, <laughs> no, sir. For though I am a fool, there is a limit to my folly. <laughs> Her mother, old Bridget Maynard, travels with us, for Elsie is a good girl. But the old woman is abed with fever, and we have come here to pick up some silver to buy an electuary for her. Uh, Harky, my girl, 
Your mother is ill. Sorely ill, sir. And needs good food and things that thou canst not buy. Alas, tis too true. Wouldst thou earn an hundred crowns? Oh, an hundred crowns? They might save her life. Oh. Then listen. A worthy but unhappy gentleman is to be beheaded in an hour on this very spot. Uh, for sufficient reasons, he desires to marry before he dies, and he hath asked me to find him a wife. Wilt thou be that wife? The wife of a man who I've never seen? Why, sir, look you, I am concerned in this, for though I am not yet wedded to Elsie Maynard, time works wonders. <clears throat> and there's no knowing what may be in store for us. Have we your worship's word for it that this gentleman will die today? Nothing is more certain, I grieve to say. And that the maiden will be allowed to depart the very instant the ceremony is at an end? The very instant. I pledge my honor that it shall be so. Oh, an hundred crowns. An hundred crowns. Oh, for my part, I consent. <laughs> but it is for Elsie to speak. How oh, say you, maiden, will you wed a man about to lose his head? For half an hour you'll be a wife, and then the dower is yours for life. A headless bridegroom I refuse. In truth, the poets tell most bridegrooms ere they marry both head and heart as well. A strange proposal you reveal. It almost makes my senses real. Alas, I'm very poor indeed, and such a sum I sorely need. My mother, sir, is like to thy this money life may bring. Bear this in mind, I pray, should I consent to do this thing? Oh, as a general rule of life, I don't allow my promised wife, my lovely bride that is to be, to marry anyone but me. Yet if the fee is promptly paid, and he in well-earned grave, within the hour is duly laid, Objection, I will wave. Yes, objection, I will wave. Temptation upon temptation will be and may intended to shun whatever your station, your fascination splendid. Of all when e'er we view you, head of ears into you, head of ears, head of ears, head of ears into you, head of ears, head of ears, head of ears, head of ears into you. So, good fellow, you are a jester? Aye, sir, and like some of my jests, out of place. I have a need of such a one. Um, tell me, what are your qualifications for such an post? Oh, marry, sir, I have a pretty wit. I can riddle you from dawn of day to set of sun, and if that content you not well unto midnight and the small hours, Oh, sir, a pretty wit, I warrant you, a pretty, pretty wit. <laughs> I jive and joke, and quip and crank, for lowly folk and men of rank. 
I ply my craft, and no, no fear, but aim my shaft at Prince of Here, at Here or Prince, at Prince or Here. I aim my shaft, and no, no fear. I have wisdom from the east and from the west that's subject to no academic rule. You may find it in the jeering of a jest or distill it from the folly of a fool. I can teach you with a quip if I've a mind. I can trick you into learning with a laugh. Oh, win all my folly, 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 and you'll find a grain or two of truth among the chaff. Oh, win all my folly, 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 and you'll find a grain or two of truth among the chaff. I can set a braggart quailing with a quip. The upstart I can wither with a whim. He may wear a merry laugh upon his lip, but his laughter has an echo that is grim. When they're offered to the world in merry guise, unpleasant truths are swallowed with a will. Oh, he would make his fellow, fellow, fellow creatures wise, should always give the philosophic pill. Oh, he would make his fellow, fellow, fellow creatures wise, should always gild the philosophic pill. And how came you to leave your last employ? <laughs> Why, sir, it was in this wise. My lord was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and it was considered that one of my jokes was unsuited to his grace's family circle. In truth, I ventured to ask a poor riddle, sir, wherein lay the difference between his grace and poor Jack Point. His grace was pleased to give it up, sir, and thereupon I told him that whereas his grace was paid 10,000 pounds a year for being good, poor Jack Point was good for nothing. <laughs> Twas but a harmless jest, but it offended his grace, who whipped me and set me in the stocks for a scuttle rogue. And so we parted. I had his leaf not take post again with the dignified clergy. But I trust you are very careful not to give offence. I have daughters. Sir! My jests are most carefully selected, and anything objectionable is expunged. If your honor pleases, I will try them first on your honor's chaplain. Uh, can you give me an example? Uh, uh, say I had sat me down hurriedly on something sharp. <laughs> Sir, I would say that you had sat down on the spur of the moment. <laughs> <Spur>. <clears throat> I don't think much of that. <laughs> is that the best you can do? It has always been much admired, sir, but we will try again. Well then, ah, mm -hmm. I, I am at dinner, and the joint of meat is but half cooked. Why then, sir, I should say <laughs> that what is underdone cannot be helped. <laughs> underdone. I see. I think that manner of thing might become somewhat irritating. Uh, sir, perhaps, but use is everything and you would come in time to like it. Well then, we will suppose, yes, we will suppose that I caught you kissing the kitchen wench under my very nose. Oh, <laughs> under her very nose, good sir. Not under yours, that is where I would kiss her. Do you take me? Oh, sir, a pretty wit, a pretty, pretty wit. <laughs> The maiden comes. Follow me, friends, and we will discuss this matter at length in my library. I am your worship's servant. That is to say, I trust I soon shall be. But before proceeding to a more serious topic, can you tell me, sir, why a cook's brain pan is like an overwhelmed clock? Enough of truce to this fooling. Follow me, friend. But the, just my luck. My best conundrum wasted.
He's an odd freak for a dying man and his confessor to be closeted alone with a strange singing girl. <laughs> I would fain have espied him, but they stopped up the keyhole. My keyhole. Wilfred, and alone. Now, what could he have wanted with her? That's what puzzles me. Now, to get the keys from him. Wilfred? Has no reprieve arrived? None. Thine adored Fairfax is to die. Nay, thou knowest that I have naught but pity for the poor condemned gentleman. I know that he who is to die is more to thee than I, who am alive and well. Why, that were out of reason, dear Wilfred. Do they not say that a live ass is better than a dead lion? No. <laughs> I don't mean that. Oh, they say that, do they? It's unpardonably rude of them, but I believe they put it in that way. Not that it applies to thee, who art clever beyond all telling. Oh, yes. As an assistant tormentor. Nay, as a wit, as a humorist. <laughs> As a most philosophic commentator on the vanity of human resolution. Truly, <laughs> I have seen great resolution give way under my persuasive methods in the nice regulation of a thumbscrew, in the hundredth part of a single revolution lieth all the difference between stony reticence and a torrent of impulsive unbosoming that the pen can scarcely follow. Ha <laughs> ha! I am a mad wag. <laughs> Thou art a most light-hearted and delightful companion, Master Wilfred. Thine anecdotes of the torture chamber are the prettiest hearing. <laughs> I am a pleasant fellow in our choose. <laughs> I believe I am the very merriest dog that barks. Aha, we might be passing happy together. Perhaps, I do not know. For thou wouldst make a most tender and loving wife. Aye, to one whom I really loved. For there is a wealth of love within this little heart, saving up for, I wonder who. Now, by all the world of men, I wonder who. Just think that he, 
who I am to wed is alive and somewhere, perhaps far away, perhaps close at hand. And I know him not. It seemeth that I am wasting time in not knowing him. Now, say that it is I. Nay, suppose it for the nonce. Say, say that we are wed. Suppose it only. Say that thou art my very bride, and I, thy cheery, joysome, bright, and frolicsome husband. Mm. The day's work being done, the prisoners all stored away from the night. Thou and I are alone together, with a long, long evening before us. It is a pretty picture, but I scarcely know it cometh so unexpectedly. And yet, and yet. Were I thy bride? Aye, wert thou my bride? Oh, how I would love thee! Were I thy bride, then all the world beside were not too wide to hold my wealth of love. Were I thy bride, upon thy breast my loving head would rest as on her nest a tender turtle dove. Were I thy bride, this heart of mine would be one heart with thine, and in that shrine our happiness would dwell. Were I thy bride, and all day long our lives should be a song, no grief, no wrong should make my heart rebel. Were I thy bride, the silvery flute, the melancholy lute, when night out hoot to my low whispered coo, were I thy bride, the skylark's trill, were but discord and shrill to their soft thrill of wooing as I'd woo. Bride, the roses sigh were as a carrion's cry to lullaby, such as I'd sing to thee. Were I thy bride, a feather's press were led in heaviness to my caress, but then, of course, you see, I'm not thy bride. <laughs> No, thou not, not yet. <laughs> but Lord, how she wooed me! I should be no mean judge of wooing, seeing that I have been more hotly wooed than most men. <laughs> I have been wooed by maid, widow, and wife. I have been wooed shyly, timidly, tearfully, joyfully, by direct assault, by suggestion, by implication, by inference, and by innuendo. But this wooing was not of the common order. This is the wooing of one who must needs woo me if she die for it. <laughs> The deed is so far safely accomplished. The sly boots, how she wheedled him. What a helpless ninny is a lovesick man. He is but a lute in a woman's hands. She plays upon him whatever tune she will. But the colonel comes, he faith, he's just in time for the yeoman parade here for his execution in two minutes. My good and kind friend, thou runnest a grave risk for me. Ah, tut, sir, no risk. I'll warrant none here will recognize you. You make a brave yeoman, sir. So, this ruff is too high. Uh, here's your halberd, sir. Carry it thus. But the yeoman come. Now remember, you are my brave son, Leonard Merrill. If I may not bear mine own name, there is none other I would bear so readily. Now, sir, put a bold face on it, for they come. <laughs>
come to join the tower waters. If so, we come to meet him, that we may bid me greet him, and welcome his arrival here with shout of shout and cheer on cheer. Hurrah! 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 Ye tower warders, nursed in war's alarms, suckled on gunpowder and we on glory. Behold my son, whose all subduing arms have told the theme of many a song and story. Forgive his aged father's pride, nor cheer his aged father's sympathetic tear. And spare me this ovation. I have small claim to such consideration. The tales that of my prowess are narrated have been prodigiously exaggerated. Prodigiously exaggerated. Tis Lost in last campaign, rescue it at deadly peril, bear it safely back again. Peril, peril, as is peril, bear it safely back again. Didst thou not, when prisoner taken and depart from all escape, face with gallant heart unshaken, death in most appalling shape? Peril, peril, face is peril, death in most appalling shape. True, the eye was to be pitied, having but an hour to live. I reluctantly submitted, I had no one alternative. Oh, the tales that are related of my deeds of daring do have been much exaggerated, very much exaggerated. Scarce a word of them is true. Scarce a word of them is true. They are not exaggerated, not at all exaggerated. Could not be exaggerated. Every word of them is true. Leonard! I beg your pardon. Don't you know me? I'm little Phoebe. Phoebe? Is this Phoebe? What? Little Phoebe? Who the deuce has she be? It can't be Phoebe, surely. Yes, it's Phoebe. Your sister Phoebe. Your own little sister. I speak the truth. Sister Phoebe. Sister Phoebe. Oh, my brother. Why, how you've grown. I didn't recognize you for so many years. Oh, my brother. Oh, my sister. Oh, oh sister. Brother. Oh, oh brother. sister. Hark him, girl, 
Let a freedom is hug, thy father and thy brother and myself. Thyself, forsooth, and who art thou thyself? Good sir, we are betrothed. Or more or less, but rather less than more. <laughs> To thy fond care I do commend thy sister. Ye to her an ever watchful guardian, eagle eyed, and when she feels, as sometimes she does feel, disposed to indiscriminate caress. Be thou a turn to take those favors from her. Be thou a turn to take those favors from her. Yes, yes, be thou a turn to take those favors from me. To thy fraternal care, thy sister I command. From every lurking snare, I loudly charge the hand. And to achieve this end, O oh, grant, I pray this boon, O oh, grant this boon. She shall not quit thy sight from morn to afternoon. From afternoon to night, from ten o'clock to two, from two to even tide, from dim twilight to eleven at night, from dim twilight to eleven at night, she shall not quit thy sight. From morn to afternoon, from afternoon to eleven at night, she shall not quit thy sight. So amiable I've grown, so innocent and well, that is So grant, I pray this boon, oh, grant this boon. I shall not quit thy sight from morn to afternoon, from afternoon to night, from seven o'clock to two, from two to eventide, from dim twilight to eleven at night, from dim twilight to eleven at night, I shall not quit thy sight. I answer yes, that task I undertake. My word I never break, I freely grant that boon, and I'll repeat my plight from morn to afternoon, from afternoon to night, from seven o'clock to two, from a tour to evening meal. From dim twilight to eleven at night, from dim twilight to eleven at night, that compact I win the sea. From afternoon, from afternoon to eleven at night, you really lost at
to tell the news I bear. I had my comrades sought the prisoner's cell. He is not there. He is not there. He sought the prisoner's cell. He is not there. As, as for, for the prisoner, prisoner we sought his cell in duty, found a double grating from one well known prisoner that told me found we hunted high. We hunted low. We hunted there. We hunted there. The man we sought with anxious care had vanished into empty air. The man we sought with anxious care had vanished into empty air. <laughs> Astounding news, the prisoner fled. Thrill, I shall forfeit me instead. My lord, I do not set him free. I hate the man, my rival be. The prisoner gone, I'm all I care. Thrill, I shall forfeit me instead. Who could have helped him to I swear? My lord, I did not set him free. Indeed, I can't imagine who I've no idea at all. Have you? Of his escape, no traces lurk and shards of blood have been at work. What have I done? Oh, poor is me. Why am I so wild of a kiss? Oh, woe is you. Your angry sink. Oh, woe is me. I rather think. Oh, woe is me. I rather think. Kiss, woe is me. I rather think. What every tide you are his bride and I am left in lonely wreck. Kiss, woe is me. I rather think. Kiss, woe is me. I rather think. Kiss, woe is me. Kiss, woe is me. Kiss, woe is me.
chain, dungeon of stone, all are in vain, prisoners flown. Spite of the all is free, is free. Whom do we want, pretty warders are ye? The Merry Jests of Hugh Ambrose, number 7,863, The Poor Wit and the Rich Counselor. A certain poor wit, being an hungered, did meet a well-fed counselor. <laughs> Marry, fool, quoth the counselor, whither away? In truth, said the poor wag, in that I've eaten naught these two days, I do wither away, and that right rapidly. The counselor laughed hugely and gave him a sausage. <laughs> the counselor was easier to please than my new master, the lieutenant. Oh, I should like to take post under that counselor. Oh, tis but melancholy mumming when poor, heartbroken, jilted Jack Point must needs turn to Hugh Ambrose for original light humor. Master Point? Ha! Friend Jailer, that was <laughs> Jailer, that never shalt be more. Come, take heart, smile, laugh, wink, twinkle. Thou tormentor, that tormentest none. Thou racker that rackest not, thou pincher out of place. Come, take heart and be merry as I am. As I am. <laughs> Aye, it's well for thee to, to laugh. Thou hast a good post and hast cause to be merry. Cause? Have we not all cause? <laughs> Is not the world a big butt of humour into which all who will may drive a gimlet? See? I am a salaried wit. And is there aught in nature more ridiculous? A poor, dull, heartbroken man who must needs be merry or he will be whipped. Who must jest you and rejoice lest he perish. Who must jest you, jibe you, quip you, crank you, rack you, riddle you from hour to hour, from day to day, from year to year, lest he dwindle perish, starve, pine, and die. Why, when there's naught else to laugh at, I laugh at myself till I ache for it. Yet I have often thought that a jester's calling would suit me to a hair. <laughs> thee? <laughs> would suit thee, thou death's head and crossbones. I? 
I have a pretty wit, a light, airy, joysome wit, spiced with anecdotes of prison cells in the torture chamber. Oh, a very delicate wit. Now, I have tried it on many a prisoner, and there have been some who smiled. <laughs> it is not easy to make a prisoner smile, and it should not be difficult to be a good jester, seeing that thou art one. Difficult? Nothing easier. Nothing easier. Attend, and I will prove it to thee. Oh, a private buffoon is a light-hearted loon if you listen to popular rumor. From the morn to the night, he's so joyous and bright, and he bubbles with wit and good humor. He's so quaint and so terse, both in prose and in verse, yet though people forgive his transgression, there are one or two rules that all family fools must observe if they love their profession. There are one or two rules, half a dozen maybe, that all family fools of whatever degree must observe if they love their profession. If you wish to succeed as a jester, you need to consider each person's auricular. What is all right for B would quite scandalize C, for C is so very particular. And D may be dull and E's very thick skull is as empty of brains as a ladle, while F is F sharp and will cry with a carp that he's known your best joke since his cradle. When your humor they flout, you can't let yourself go, and it does put you out when a person says, oh, I have known that old jokes since my cradle. If your master is surly from getting up early and tempers are short in the morning, an inopportune joke is enough to provoke him to give you at once a month's warning, then if you refrain, he is at you again, for he likes to get value for money. He'll ask then and there, with an insolent stare, if you know that you're paid to be funny. It adds to the task of a merryman's place, when your prince will ask with a scowl on his face. If you know that you're paid to be funny. Comes a bishop, maybe, or a solemn DD, oh, beware of his anger provoking. Better not pull his head or stick pins in his chair, he'll not understand practical joking. If the jest that you crack have an orthodox smack, you may get a bland smile from these sages. But should they by chance be imported from France, half a crown is knocked out of your wages. It's a general rule, though you'll see it may quench. If the family fool tells a joke that's too French, <laughs> half a crown is knocked out of his wages. <laughs> Though your head it may rack with a bilious attack and your senses with toothache you're losing. Don't be mopey and flat, they don't find you for that if you're properly quaint and amusing. Though your wife ran away with a soldier that day and took with you a trifle of money. Bless your heart, they don't mind. They're exceedingly kind. They don't blame you so long as you're funny. It's a comfort to feel if you punish a bit. Though you suffer a deal, they don't mind it a bit. They don't blame you so long as you're funny. <laughs> And so thou wouldst be a jest, eh? Aye. Now listen, my sweetheart, Elsie Maynard, was secretly wed to this Fairfax half an hour ere he escaped. Oh, she did well. <laughs> She did nothing of the kind, so hold thy peace and perpend. Now listen, all the while he liveth, she is dead to me, and I to her. So my jibes and jokes notwithstanding, I am the saddest and sorriest dog in England. Thou art a very dull dog indeed. Now, if thou wilt swear that thou didst shoot this Fairfax while he was trying to swim across the river. It needs but the discharge of an arquebus on a dark night, and that he sank and was seen no more. I'll make thee the very Archbishop of Jesters, and that in two days' time. Now what sayest thou? I am to lie heartily. But thy lie must be a lie of circumstance, which I will support with the testimony of eyes, ears, and tongue. And thou wilt qualify me as a jester? Oh, as a jester, among jesters, I'll teach thee all my original songs, <laughs> my self-constructed riddles, my own ingenious paradoxes. 
Nay more, I'll reveal to thee the source whence I get them. Now, what sayest thou? Why, if it be but a lie thou wantest of me, I hold it cheap enough. I say yes, it is a bargain. Days gone, and no news of poor Fairfax. But the dolts, they seek him everywhere save within a dozen yards of his dungeon. So, I am free. Free. Ha. The tower bonds were but a thread of silk compared with these conjugal fetters, which I, fool that I was, placed upon mine own hands. From the one I broke readily enough. How to break the other? Free from his fetters grim, free to depart, free both in life and limb, in all but heart, bound to an unknown bride for good and ill. Ah, is not one so tied, a prisoner still, a prisoner still. Ah, is not one so tied, a prisoner still. In fetters held till his last hour, the jibes that no smith can wend, no rust devour. Although a monarch's hand had set him free, all the captive band. The saddest he, the saddest he. Of all the captive band, the saddest, the saddest he. Yeah. <laughs> 
Sergeant Merrill, and how fares thy pretty charge, Elsie Maynard? Well enough, sir. She's quite strong again and leads us tonight. Thanks to Dame Carruthers' kind nursing, eh? <laughs> I deuce take the old witch. Uh, it was but a sorry trick you played me, sir, to bring the fainting girl to me. It gave the old lady an excuse for taking up her quarters in my house. <laughs> and for the last two years, I've shunned her like the plague. Another day of it, and she would have married me. Oh, good Lord, here she is again. I'll e'en go. Nay, Sergeant Merrill, don't go. I have something of grave import to say to thee. It's coming. In faith, I think I'm not wanted here. Nay, Master Leonard, I've naught to say to thy father that his son may not hear. Two. I'm one of the family. I had forgotten. <laughs> Tis about this Elsie Maynard, a pretty girl, Master Leonard. Aye, fair as a peach blossom. But what then? She hath a liking for thee, if I mistake not. By my heart. She's as dainty a little maid as you'll find on a midsummer day's mark. Then be warned in time and give not thy heart to her. Oh, I know what it is to give my heart to one who will have none of it. Aye, <laughs> she knows all about that. <laughs> and why is my boy to take heed of her? She's a good girl, Dame Carruthers. Good enough for aught I know, but she's no girl. She's a married woman. Married woman? Tush, old lady. She's promised to Jack Point, the lieutenant's new jester. Tush in thy teeth, old man. As my niece Kate sat by her bedside today, this Elsie slept. And as she slept, she moaned and groaned and turned this way and that way. And how shall I marry one I have never seen, quoth she. Then an hundred crowns, quoth she. Then... Is it certain he will die in an hour, quoth she? Then I love him not, and yet I am his wife, quoth she. Is it not so, Kate? Aye, aunt, tis even so. Art thou sure of all this? <laughs> Aye, sir, for I wrote it all down on my tablets. Now mark my words, it was of this Fairfax she spake, and he is her husband, or I'll swallow me curtle. Is this true, sir? True, but why the girl was waving? Why should she marry a man who had but an hour to live? Marry? There be those who would marry but for a minute rather than die old maids. <laughs> I, I know one of them. <laughs> Stranger adventure, adventure made a way. Yeah. 
So, my mysterious bride is none other than this winsome Elsie. <laughs> By my hand, tis no such ill plunge in fortune's lucky bag. I might have fared worse with my eyes open. But she comes. Now to test her principles, tis not every husband who has a chance of wooing his own wife. <laughs> <laughs> Mistress Elsie. Master Leonard. So thou leavest us tonight. Yes, Master Leonard. I have been kindly tended, and I almost fear I am loath to go. And this Fairfax, was thou glad when he escaped? Why, truly, Master Leonard, it is a sad thing when a young and gallant gentleman should die in the very fullness of his life. Then, when thou didst faint in my arms, it was for joy at his safety? It may be so. I was highly wrought, and I am but a girl, and so when I am highly wrought, I faint. <laughs> now dost thou know I am consumed with a parlous jealousy. Thou? And of whom? Why, of this fair fact, surely. Of Colonel Fairfax? Aye. Shall I be frank with thee? Elsie, I love thee ardently, passionately. Elsie, I have loved thee these two days, which is a long time. <laughs> And I would fain join my life with thine. Oh, Master Leonard, thou art jesting. Jesting? May I shrivel into raisins if I jest? I love thee with a love that is a fever, with a love that is a frenzy, with a love that eateth up my heart. What sayest thou? Thou wilt not let my heart be eaten up. Oh, mercy, what have I to say? Dost thou love me, or hast thou been insensible these two days? I love all brave men. Nay. There is love in excess. I thank heaven there are many brave men in England, but if thou lovest them all, I withdraw my thanks. I love the bravest best, but, sir, I may not listen. I am not free. I am a wife. Thou a wife? Whose? His name? His days are numbered. Oh. Nay, his grave is dug and his epitaph set up. Come, his name! Oh, sir, keep my secret, for it is the only barrier that fate could set up between us. My husband is none other than Colonel Fairfax. The greatest villain unhung, the most ill-favoured, ill-mannered, ill-natured, ill-omened, ill-tempered dog in Christendom. It is very like, but he is not to me. For I never saw him. I was blindfolded, and he was supposed to have died within the hour, and he did not die, and I am wedded to him, and my heart is broken. He was to have died, but he did not die. The scoundrel, the perjured, traitorous villain, thou shouldst have insisted on his dying first, to be sure. <laughs> Tis the only way with these fair facts. I now wish I had. Bloodthirsty little maiden. Listen to me. Be mine. He will never know. He dares not show himself, and if he dare, what art thou to him? Fly with me, Elsie. We shall be married tomorrow, and thou shalt be the happiest wife in England. Master Leonard, I am amazed. Is it thus that brave soldiers speak to poor girls? Oh, for shame, for shame. I am wed, and not the less because I love not my husband. I am a wife, sir. I have a duty, and... Thy words terrify me. They are not honest. They are wicked words and unworthy thy great and brave heart. Oh, shame upon thee. Shame upon thee. Nay, Elsie, I did but jest. I spake but to try I... thee. Hark, what was that, sir? Why, an ark was fired from the wharf, unless I much mistake. Strange, and at such an hour, what can it mean? Now what can that have been? A shot so late at night, enough to cause a fight. What can the portent mean? Who fired that shot? At once the truth declare. My lord, it was I. 
to rashly judge forbear. My lord, t'was he to rashly judge forbear. Like a ghost is vigil keeping. Or a spectre all appalling. I beheld a figure creeping. I should rather call it crawling. He was creeping. He was crawling. He was creeping, creeping. Crawling. He was creeping. He was crawling. He was creeping, creeping. Crawling. Not a moment's hesitation. I myself upon him flung. With a hurried exclamation to his draperies I hung. Then we closed with one another in a rough and tumble smother. Colonel Fairfax and no other was the man to whom I clung. Colonel Fairfax and no other. Colonel Fairfax and no other. Colonel Fairfax and no other was the man to whom he hung. After Mikey tug and tussle, it resembled more a struggle. He bites into stronger muscle, or by some infernal juggle. From my clutches quickly sliding, I should rather call it slipping. With a view, no doubt, of hiding, or escaping to the shipping. With a gasp and with a quiver, I describe it as a shiver. Down he dived into the river, and alas, I cannot swim. It's not to be called shiver, but a gasp and with a quiver. Down he dived into the river, and alas, I cannot swim. Ingenuity is catching with the king of his pleasing off with us from century snatching. I should rather call it seizing. With an ounce or two of lead, I dispatched him through the head. With an ounce or two of lead, he dispatched him through the head. I discharged it without winking. Little time I lost in sinking. Like a stone, I saw him sinking. I should say a lump of lead. He discharged it without winking. Little time he lost in sinking. Like a stone, I saw him sinking. I should say a lump of lead. Like a stone, my boy, I said. Like a heavy lump of lead. Like a stone, my boy, I said. Like a heavy lump of lead. Anyhow, the man is dead. Whether stone or lump of lead. Anyhow, the man is dead. The river must be dragged, no time be lost. The body must be found at any cost. To this attend. Without undue delay, so set to work with what dispatch ye may. Yes, yes, so set to work with what dispatch ye may. Sweetheart, be comforted. This Fairfax was but a pestilent fellow, and as he had to die, he might as well die thus as any other way. It was a good death. Still, he was my husband, and had he not been, he was nevertheless a living man, and now he is dead. And so, by your leave, my tears may flow unchidden, Master Point. And thou didst see all this? I? With both eyes at once, this and that. <laughs> the testimony of one eye is naught. He may lie. <laughs> but when it is corroborated by the other, it is good evidence that none may gainsay. Here are both present in court, ready to swear to him. But art thou sure it was Colonel Fairfax? Saw you his face? Aye. And a plaguy, ill-favoured face, too. A very hangdog face. A felon face. A face to fright the headsman himself and make him strike a wry. Oh, a plaguy bad face. Take my word for it. <laughs> How they laugh. Tis ever thus with simple folk. An accepted wit has but to say pass the mustard and they roar their ribs out. If ever I come to life again, thou shalt pay for this, Master Point. <laughs> now, Elsie, thou art free to choose again, so behold me. I am young and well favoured. I have a pretty wit. I can jest you, jibe you, quip you, crank you, rush you. man, thou knowst not how to woo. Tis not to be done with time-worn jests and threadbare sophistries, with quips, conundrums, rhymes, and paradoxes. It is an art in itself. 
and must be studied gravely and conscientiously. A man who would woo a fair maid should apprentice himself to the trade and study all day in methodical way how to flatter, cajole, and persuade. He should apprentice himself at fourteen and practice from morning to e'en. And when he's of age, if he will, I'll engage, he may capture the heart of a queen. The heart of a queen. It is surely a matter of skill which all may attain if they will. But every jack he must study the knack If he wants to make sure of his jill He wants to make sure of his jill If he's made the best use of his time His twig is so carefully alive That every bird may come down the bed Whatever its plumage or climb, he must learn that the thrill of a touch may mean little or nothing or much. It's an instrument rare to be handled with care and ought to be treated as such. Ought to be treated as such. It is purely a matter of skill, which all may attain if they will. But every jack he must study the knack If he wants to make sure of his jill He wants to make sure of his jill And then a glance may be timid or free It may vary in mighty degree from an impudent stare to a look of despair that no maid without pity can see. But a glance of despair is no guide. It may have its ridiculous side. It may draw you a tear or a box on the ear. You can never be sure till you've tried. Never be sure till you It is purely a matter of skill, which all may attain if they will. But every jack he must study the knack if he wants to make sure of his jill. If he wants to make sure of his jill. But every jack must study the knack. But every jack must study the knack if he wants to make sure of his jill. Yes, every jack he must start in a nap if he wants to be sure. Oh, his Now listen to me, tis done thus. <laughs> Mistress Elsie, there is one here whom, as thou knowest, lovest thee right well. Oh, that he does right well! <laughs> he is but a man of poor estate, but he hath an honest, loving heart. He will be a true and trusty husband to thee, and if thou wilt be his wife, thou shalt lie curled up in his heart like a little squirrel in its nest. Oh, tis a pretty figure. A maggot in a nut lies closer, but screw will do. <laughs> he knoweth that thou wast a wife, an unloved and unloving wife, and his poor heart was close to breaking. But now that thine unloving husband is dead, and thou art free, he would fain pray that thou wouldst hearken unto him, and give hope that thou wouldst one day be his. He presses her hand, and he whispers in her ear, Odds bodikins, what does it mean? Now, sweetheart, tell me, 
Wilt thou be this poor good fellow's wife? If the good brave man, is he a brave man? So men say. <gasps> That's not true, but let it pass. <laughs> if the brave man would be content with a poor, penniless, untaught maid. Widow, but let that pass. I will be a true and loving wife, and that with my heart of hearts. <laughs> my own dear love! <laughs> Why, what's all this? <laughs> brother, brother, it is not seemly. Oh, I can't let that pass. <laughs> oh, enough, Master Leonard. An advocate should have his fee, but me thinks thou art overpaying thyself. Nay, that is for Elsie to say. I promised thee I would show thee how to woo, and herein lies the proof of the virtue of my teaching. Go thou and apply it elsewhere. When the wooer goes a wooing, not as true the nature. Made and harshing all his suing, boldly blushing, bravely coy, bravely coy, boldly blush. Happy days of doing, the happy days of doing, all the sighing and the sewing, when a wood is a wooing, all the sweets that never cloy. When a brother leaves his sister for another, sister weeps, tears that trickle, tears that blister, tears but mickle, sister reaps, tears that trickle. Tears that bliss. Oh, the doing and undoing. The doing and undoing. Oh, the sighing and the sewing. When a brother goes a wooing and a sobbing sister weeps. When a jester is outwitted, feelings fester, heart is led. Food for fishes, only fitted. Jester wishes he was dead. Food for fishes, only fitted. Jester wishes he was dead. Oh, the doing and undoing, oh, the sighing and the sewing. When a jester goes a wooing and he wishes he. everything I could think of to make folk believe I was his loving sister, and this is his gratitude. Before I pretend to be sister to anybody again, I'll turn none and be sister to everybody, <laughs> one as much as another. <laughs> often wet for jealousy. Well, tis for jealousy I weep now. Ay, yellow bilious jaundice jealousy. Make the most of that, Master Wilfred. Oh, I have never given thee cause for jealousy. The lieutenant's cook maid and I are but the merest gossips. I'm jealous of thee, bah! I am jealous of no craven cock on a hill who crows about what he do when he daren't. I am jealous of another and a better man than thou. Set that down, Master Wilfred. And he is to marry Elsie Maynard, the little pale fool. Set that down, Master Wilfred. And my heart is well nigh broken. There, thou hast all of it. 
make the most of it. The man thou lovest <laughs> is to marry Elsie Maynard. <laughs> well, that is no other than thy brother, Leonard Merrill. <laughs> oh, mercy, what have I said? Sir, <laughs> what manner of brother is this, thou, thou lying little jade? Speak! Who is this man that thou hast called brother, and fondled, <laughs> and coddled, and kissed with my connivance? Oh, Lord, with my connivance. Should it be this fair? <gasps> it is! It is this accursed Fairfax! <laughs> it's Fairfax! Fairfax! Who I... Who thou has just shot through the head and who lies at the bottom of the river! Ah. <laughs> oh. I... I may have been mistaken. <laughs> we are but fallible mortals, the best of us. But I'll make sure. I'll make sure! Stay! One word. I think it cannot be fair. Facts mind, I say, I think. Because thou hast just slain Fairfax. But whether he be Fairfax or no Fairfax, he is to marry Elsie, and, and as thou hast shot him through the head and he is dead, be content with that and I will be thy wife. Is that sure? Aye, for sure, for there's no help for it. Thou art a very brute, but even brutes must marry, I suppose. <laughs> My beloved oh. Phoebe, Phoebe, rejoice, for I bring great glad tidings. Colonel Fairfax's reprieve was signed two days since, but was kept foully and maliciously apart by Secretary Portwistle, who designed that it should arrive only after the Colonel's death. It hath just come to hand and is now in the Lieutenant's possession. And the Colonel is free? Aye. Oh, kiss me, kiss me, my dear, kiss me again <laughs> and again! Odds, <laughs> Bobs! Death of my life! Are you mad? Am I mad? Are we all mad? Oh, my dear, my dear, I am well nigh crazed with joy. Run away from him, thou hussy, thou jade, thou kissing, clinging cockatrice. And as for thee, sir, the devil take thee. I'll rip thee like a herring for this. I'll skin thee for it. I'll cleave thee to the chine. Oh, Phoebe, who is this man? <laughs> Peace, fool, he is my brother. Another brother? <laughs> Are there any more of them? Produce them all at once and let me know the worst. This is the real Leonard Dalt. The other was but his substitute. The real Leonard, I say, my father's own son. How do I know this? Has he brother writ large on his brow? I mistrust thy brothers, for thou art a false jade. Now, Wilfred, be just. Truly did I deceive thee before, but it was to save a precious life, and save it not for me, but for another. They are to be wedded this very day. Is this not enough for thee? Come, I am thy Phoebe, thy very own. And we will be wed in a year, or two, or three at the most. Is that not enough for thee? Phoebe, hast thou heard the brave news? Aye, father. I'm thy man with joy. <laughs> Why, what's all this? Oh, father, he discovered our secret through my folly and the price of his silence is... Phoebe's heart! <laughs> Oh dear, no. Phoebe's hand. <laughs> it's the same thing, is it? <laughs> Tis a pity, but the Colonel had to be saved at any cost. And as thy folly revealed our secret, thy folly must e'en suffer for it. Dame Carruthers. So this is a plot to shield this archfiend, and I have detected it. A word from me, and three heads would roll from their shoulders. Nay, Colonel Fairfax is reprieved. Yet if my complicity in his escape were known, 
plague on the old meddler, there's nothing for it. Hush, pretty one. <laughs> Such bloodthirsty words ill become those cherry lips. Sergeant Merrill. <laughs> Why, look ye, Sir Chuck. For many a month now, I've, uh, I've thought to myself, there's a snug love saving up in that middle-aged bosom for someone, and why not for thee? That's me. <laughs> so take heart and tell her, that's thee, and that thou, that's me, <laughs> lovest her. Thee. And, and, well, I'm a miserable old man, and I've done it, and that's me. But not a word about Fairfax. The price of thy silence Meryl's is... Merrill's heart? No, Merrill's hand. It's the same thing. Is it? <laughs> Rapture, rapture, when love's votary Flushed with capture seeks a notary Joy and jollity, then is polity Reigns frivolity, rapture, rapture Joy and jollity, then is polity Reigns frivolity, rapture, rapture Doleful, doleful, when humanity With its soulful of satanity Caught in cleavity, down declivity Seize captivity, doleful, doleful Caught in cleavity, down declivity Seize captivity, doleful, doleful Joyful, joyful, when virginity Seeks a coyful man's affinity Built to flowery blight and bowery, it is a dowery, joyful, joyful. Say to flowery, bright and bowery, it is a dowery, joyful, joyful. Ghastly, ghastly, when man sorrowful, firstly, lastly, of tomorrowful, after tarrying, yields to harrying, goes a marrying. Ghastly, ghastly, joyful, joyful. Ghastly, ghastly, joyful, joyful. Ghastly, ghastly, joyful, 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 joyful.
51, I bring to thee news, good or ill, it is for thee to say. Thy husband lives, and he is free, and comes to claim his bride this very day. Don't go, recall those words, it cannot be. Claim thee as my bride. Oh, what is all the lasting claims thee as his bride? A suppliant at thy feet I fall. Thine heart will yield to pity's call. Mine is a heart of massive rock unmoved by sentimental shock What ye do, attend to me and shed a tear or two. 
before I have a song to sing. To the moon by a love lord moon who fled from the mocking throng. Oh, it's the song of a merry man moping mum, who saw and was sad and has craved no crumb, who sipped no sup and who craved no crumb as he sighed for the flood. Song to sing, oh. What is your song called? It is sung with the ring of a song made sing who love with a love life long. Oh, it's a song of a merry maid nestling near who loved the Lord but who shed a tear for the love of a merry man moping mum whose soul was sad and whose glance was glum. Who sipped no sup and who craved no crumb as he sighed for the love of a lady. Lovelorn Jack Point at the end there of Gilbert and Sullivan's Yeoman of the Guard. But a wonderful performance by this starry cast, conducted by Jane Glover. Stephen Whitson and Wayne Fitzsimmons playing the first and second citizens. Mary Bevan singing Kate. Jonathan McGovern and Marcus Farnsworth, the first and second yeoman. That's Tom Randall who sang Leonard Merrill. Lee Melrose singing Lieutenant Sir Richard Chumley, Toby Stafford Allen and Wilfred Shadbolt. That's Heather Ship playing Phoebe Merrill, Mark Richardson playing her father, Dame Felicity Palmer playing Dame Carruthers, Andrew Kennedy, Colonel Fairfax, Lisa Milne who was playing Elsie Maynard, and Mark Stone, Jack Point. Ably supported, of course, by the BBC Concert Orchestra and the BBC Singers. And that's Matthew Hamilton, the chorus master of the BBC Singers, being acknowledged by Jane Glover. She's no stranger to appearing in Gilbert and Sullivan. You know, she appeared at university in a production of Ilanthe, directed by Mel Smith, weren't you know? That's director Martin Duncan and his assistant director Steve Elias there. All of them uh, enjoying this moment. Well, we will be back as usual next Thursday and Friday with more from the proms on BBC Four. And do join us again here on BBC Two next Saturday night for a real proms treat. The sparkling John Wilson Orchestra are bringing a night of Broadway glamour to the Royal Albert Hall with a stunning lineup of singers, including Sierra Borges, Seth MacFarlane, and Julian Ovenden. For now, though, have a very good night.